My name is Esther DeBryan, and I'm a lecturer in African Literature in the Department of English at King's College London. And today I'm going to be discussing the relationship of Afrofuturism with African Futurism. And I do want to suggest that it is a relationship with and not simply to. I'm also going to be introducing several excellent texts that are not yet well known, even within the field of African Literary Studies. Afrofuturism is a term that's been gaining increasing popular exposure in recent years, especially with the film The Black Panther, and with the introduction of characters like Nakia, played by Lupita Nyong'o, and T'Challa, played by Chadwick Boseman, who will remain iconic in our memories for his path-breaking symbolic role as an ascendant African moving into the future. Afrofuturism has been variously defined, but Yitasha Womack's definition in this pertinent work, Afrofuturism, the World of Black Sci-Fi and Fantasy Culture, remains, for me, perhaps the most valuable for both its expansiveness and its precision. Womack says, Afrofuturism is an intersection of imagination, technology, the future, and liberation. And this last word, liberation, is probably the most essential in the list. Whether through literature, visual arts, music, or grassroots organizing, Afrofuturists redefine culture and notions of Blackness for today and the future. And this element of time, the pertinence of the now for the tomorrow, is something that we'll be coming back to. She goes on. Both an artistic aesthetic and a framework for critical theory, Afrofuturism combines elements of science fiction, historical fiction, speculative fiction, fantasy, Afro Afrocentricity, and magic realism with non-Western beliefs. And with Western here, Womack is referring to something that is European derived. So Afrofuturistic literature is influenced by and fe feeds back into a broad Afrofuturistic artistic matrix. And another way of saying that it is a framework for critical theory is to say it supplies a critical or theoretical methodology. And that methodology is, it must be said, inherently anti-racist. It's a mode of situating Black or African personhood within a concept of modernity that is not predicated on Black negation. That's to say, Afrofuturism's critical framework faces the concept of modernity as a powerful Eurocentric discourse, one that's rooted in a patronizing philosophical idea of progress, where progress is defined by a European, including a British, model of linear development through time from savagery to enlightened civilization. And this notion of development is predicated on capitalist expansion and colonialism. So it is a triumphant trajectory that is recorded as uppercase H history. Those who are deemed to have not yet progressed along this line are first of all identified from an imperial perspective as subhuman. And second, their paths are made to be inadmissible to what is considered African, sorry, considered history proper. Afrofuturists intentionally encounter this influential thought, and, um, and especially the way that it was established in 18th and 19th century social theorists and philosoph with philosophers such as Hegel, who claimed that people of African heritage had no place in history. This is what he says in The Philosophy of History, published in 1824. The black person, as already observed, exhibits the natural man in his completely wild and untamed state. We must lay aside all thought of reverence and morality, all that we call feeling, if we would rightly comprehend him. There is nothing harmonious with humanity to be found in this type of character. And this is how Africa was represented to the rest of the world and also fed back to Africans themselves. Hegel goes on. 
Oops. There, Africa is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. What we properly understand by Africa is the unhistorical, undeveloped spirit still involved in the conditions of mere nature and which had to be presented here only as on the threshold of the world's history. Movement, development, these are not recognized or counted if a people's logic did not conform with Western European thinking. Their intelligence was not seen or heard if it could not be measured through writing. Those people who, and cultures, deemed subhuman by these standards were, and still are, forcibly through imperial projects put on course to participate in this Eurocentric idea of modernity by productively productively contributing to global capitalist expansion. <clears throat> it is in this way that Toni Morrison, in an interview with Paul Gilroy, author of The Black Atlantic, among other texts, um, names transatlantic slaves the first moderns, saying their strategies for survival made the truly modern person. They were forcibly dispossessed alienated and commodified in a project to make not just America, but Britain and other European nation states great. Expanding on Toni Morrison's identification of Africans as the first moderns, Kojo Eshun, author of the first thoroughgoing theorization of Afrofuturism, More Brilliant Than the Sun, and this text is more brilliant than the sun, uh, he says that this Alienation, dislocation, and dehumanization was what philosophers like Nietzsche, Nietzsche would later define as quintessentially modern. Another brilliant literary critic and Afrofuturistic speculative writer, Sophia Samatar, and everything that she writes is scintillating, uh, such as this novel, A Stranger in a Laundria. I definitely recommend you read her. Samatar also weighs in on this influential conversation between Toni Morrison and Paul Gilroy. Sam Samatar highlights Gilroy's remark that the dreadful objectivity of black modernity, as it was imperially constructed, flows from being both inside and outside the West. Um, so confrontating that dominating philosophical ideal of the modern from the inside and the outside requires a return to pa the past and sometimes a radical disruption of it. As Womack says of Afrofuturistic arts, in some cases, it's a total re-envisioning of the past and, specula and speculation about, future, uh, about the future rife with cultural critiques. For some African writers, the rootedness of African-American and Caribbean Afrofuturistic imaginings in transatlantic trauma and the racialization that has extended from it makes the term Afrofuturism inappropriate, um, inappropriate for even irrelevant to the continental experience. In an essay that introduces her stunning collection of short stories, Intruders, the South African writer Mohale Mashiho sends up the blatant reminder that the term Afrofuturism was coined by an American scholar, Mark Derry. She does so by making his definition the epithet to her essay. She shows that, or reminds us, that with Afrofuturism, Derry refers to speculative fiction that addresses African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns. Shiho claims that the American experience of racialization is nothing like her own, even though she comes from a, and lives in a settler colony. <clears throat> what was a settler colony, I should say. In her view, she says, Afrofuturism is an escape for those who find themselves in the minority and divorced or violently removed from their African roots. So they imagine a black future where they aren't a minority, and are able to marry their culture with technology. Mashiho says in this, in this essay that she's not a writer, sorry, she's not an academic, she is a writer, and so she doesn't advance a replacement term, but others take that up as we'll see in, in just a moment. Certainly authors who are now considered Afrofuturism's early writers are American, 
uh, writers such as Ursula Le Guin, uh, Samuel Delaney, and Octavia Butler, just to name a few. One of the earliest recently recovered texts, W.E.B. Du Bois's short story, The Princess Steel, which was published between 1908 and 1910. It centers on a black sociologist, Dr. Hannibal Johnson's recovery of what he calls the great mirror into white consciousness. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. Um, Dr. Johnson creates a virtual experience for his white sociologist guests with uh, what is called a megascope. And he takes them through a techno-mystical process, which is aimed at recovering into their kinetic memory the rupture of slavery as the original, as the origin of African American trauma and exploitation. In this story, the princess is brutally torn from her mother, and then with her mystically extending hair, she is enslaved to the steel industry. Her hair chains her in place, and it forces her to corporally constitute that capitalistic venture. This story exposes how the racialized categories of the small near and the great far, those who are visible but are made small, those who are great um, but distinguish themselves as distant, how these categories were violently established. And they're categories that the white sociologist guests seem to uphold when they arrive as they initially dismiss the black techno genius as a servant. However, this story of trauma other African writers agree with Meshiho is not the continent story. It is not African central preoccupation of past, present, or future. British Nigerian Tade Thompson, um, who is the author of the exquisite Rosewater trilogy, says something similar. He calls Afrofuturism geopolitically inappropriate for the continent. He says it risks the erasure of the African for the African-American when the history is being told. For her part, Mohale Mashiho employs a South African idiomatic expression and also an 80s pop song by Mercy Pekela to reject the term. She argues that Afrofuturism for Africa is like Ayashis Emateki. And this phrase refers to shoes that are too small, but that one wears because that's what one has. She says, the shoes are burning my feet because they are too tight. She goes on to say, Africans living in Africa need something entirely different. Then in a more barbed tone, we actually live on this continent as opposed to using it as a costume or as a stage to play out our ideas. Mashiho asks, how does who we are right now affect an imagined future? As several critics have, have observed, the right now, the present, remains essential for Afrofuturist, or we could say more broadly, Afro-speculative arts. They can be seen as casting the present as future. Sorry, they can be seen as casting the present as history. They imagine where we might reach or end up if we keep to our current trajectory. Both in Kojo Shun's visionary work, More Brilliant Than the Sun, which we've already uh, noted, and his essay, Further Considerations on Afrofuturism, Ishun samples William Gibson's statement that science fiction doesn't predict the future, it pre-programs it in the image of the present. Several writers, several African writers insist that the African experience be distinguished, that their writing be seen for how it pre-programs their particular present according to their own identifiable trajectory from past leading into the future. So what does it mean to pre-program the present? Um, Eshun explains and illustrates that it involves making visibly felt and understood the continued and intensifying thrust of dominant capitalist power into the future, like the doctor does in The Princess Steel. Bringing attention to the fact that this power depends for its own triumphalist futuristic vision on a process of othering, dehumanization and exploitation. It must be said these are the same processes that drove the transatlantic slave trade. 
But of course, it also involves refusing to comply with that devastating vision, imagining alternatives where the social relations are radically overturned. One feature that distinguishes African futuristic arts that it is that speculative that supernatural speculative forms are given a particular prominence. The right now of the African experience is often expressed through narratives, storylines, characters, and figures that are drawn from folklore, um, from local metaphysical systems of knowledge, and from contemporary urban legends. Oops. For instance, in Mashiho's, uh, Mashiho's short story collection, Intruders, the story in Tatisi exposes and addresses a predatory mi misogyny that is stultifying for South African women. And she does so by way of a folk tale that she gives quantum power. In this story, the girl in Tatisi finds out in a letter from her mother, which is signaled to her via an SOS on her phone, that she is descended from Ceylan. And Ceylan is a girl from a well-known Sesotho folktale, Ceylan and the Giant. In the original folktale, Ceylan escapes being captured by a cannibalistic giant. In this story, the giant's descendants are after Intatisi. But the letter from her mother offers maternal home, hope. The mother gives Intatisi instructions for escaping and promises that they'll reunite. This story shows that past patriarchal violence cannot be relayed as history. Uh, it cannot remain as a folktale in the past. Rather, in the imaginative realm of this story, where the past penetrates the, the present and threatens the future, maternal guidance and protection could overthrow the narrative power of the tyrannical giant. We find something similar in Enedi Okorafor's hot novel, the Book of Phoenix. The, this is the prequel to one of her best-known novels, Who Fears Death. There, the trickster Anansi takes on a new technopunk guise in the form of multiple robot spiders. These Anansi bots are intended to guard oil pipelines in Nigeria, but they go rogue and vampirically attack all who get in their way. Interestingly, they retain the survivalist heritage of the original Anansi, whose stories of subterfuge buoyed those who were enslaved. This version of Anansi also crosses the Atlantic, and it is to wreak havoc on their technocratic programmers who are intent on harnessing Africa's juju power in African subjects uh, in a bid to assume corporate power on a global scale global scale. Okorafor offers a new classification for the continent-based writing. She calls it African Futurism. In her texts, science fiction merges and is some, sometimes replaced with what she calls Juju Futurism, where Juju, and this is spiritual power that usually is carried in material form, it operates as one more mode of technology. Okorafor recovers the concept juju from its demonization, demonization that has occurred via waves of Christian missionary movements. In her writing, juju is part of a, a culturally sustaining metaphysical. <laughs> juju is part of a culturally sustaining metaphysical conception of the world, where spiritual and physical realms interpenetrate, and, and where the unborn living and ancestors coexist. The potential of the undead to transform the future is given another representation in Mati Diop's award-winning film, Atlantics. And spoiler alert here, I'm going to talk about the plot a little bit. So uh, cover your ears, close your eyes for about 20 seconds if you don't want to know about it. In Atlantics, a group of young men claim their due from their absurdly wealthy corporate exploiter after their own deaths. This group of young construction workers are drowned attempting to reach Spain and they return to haunt the wealthy CEO who denied them their wages and forced them into this impossible precarity. At the end of the film, it isn't certain what the ramifications will be of the undead's victory, but they are explicitly named the young men of the future. And this signal signals a 
a shift in the social hierarchy, and it is a metaphysical shift in that hierarchy. It's worth noting here that as this film and many other examples from the continent exhibit, the preoccupations of Africans, while locally specific, still share many similarities with those of diasporic Africans. Mohale Mashiho's own list of South African preoccupations includes the blights of white supremacy, poverty, political corruption, and, un and unequal educational and economic opportunities. And also the ramifications of these for the direction of technology, for who has access to technology and what they might do with it. In African futuristic texts, figures like the Phoenix hold out promise for an uprising from the ashes of various imperialist and autocratic atrocities. And accordingly, many of these worlds are dystopic, though rarely lost ones. In the words of African speculative art critic Matthew Melski, these are African post-crisis narratives. He calls them stories of the African Anthropocene. And with Anthropocene, he's referring to how the end of corporate, imperial, and autocratic greed is a continent wasted of its resources. Mineral, ecological, territorial, intellectual, human. The critique of African futuristic texts is often directed inward as much as it is outward. For instance, we're not told in Wanuri Cahew's film, Pumzi, what led to the nuclear contamination that's left this East African territory of the Metu community a wasteland 35 years after the end of World War III. But what is depicted is a Metu run neuropolitical surveillance state, to borrow a term from Matthew Melski. The biopower of the governing council extends to controlling thought. The lead character, Aisha, finds a way to escape so that she can plant what we might call a juju-invested tree of life, seed for a tree of life, but only by sacrificing her own body. We find an even more critical finger pointing inward in Dilman Dilla's stories, Lights on Water and A Wife and a Slave, in his outstanding collection, Killing It in the Sun, which you all should also read. These stories represent a smart city of floating pyramids in the territory that was once Uganda, and it's now guarded by an ornithopter patrol that vaporizes any who try to escape its borders. It's governed by a despotic emperor who's cut off his citizens from Europe and America, but has adopted and taken to nightmarish extremes the worst patriarchal and hierarchical ideologies of empire. For instance, in A Wife and a Slave, um, uh, society is, de is depicted in which by law, women are indoctrinated to perform a constant dispassionate subservience to their husbands and men are also forced to, to enforce it. In that story, um, a couple at their breaking point recover their connection when Akala, the wife, unlawfully asserts her sensuality. In African futuristic narratives, the danger of future patriarchal tyranny and its devastating effects both for men and women is given sobering exposure even as women characters such as Akala and Tatisi, Aisha and Phoenix are empowered to overturn their society's patriarchal orders. Another angle of critique, and this is a, an eco-critical one, comes in Dilla's story, Lights on Water, um, which is, uh, takes place in the same imaginative, in, imaginative world. Here, the natural world has been so thoroughly demon, demonized through the religious indoctrination of the Ministry of Spiritual Affairs, that almost no citizen can fathom its beauty, nor even want to imagine that it might be accessible. Here, Songo, a propagandist artist, uh, attempts to shift the citizen's consciousness by showering the city with hundreds of thousands of prints of a painting that's done in his mystically convincing style which reveals his daughter Kimi reveling in the sea.
All of these African futuristic narratives serve as checks on the present distortions of power, power political and technological by authoritarian regimes. For the crucial resonances that we find between African-American, Caribbean, and African futuristic texts, Sophia Samatar would encourage us to shift our thinking to a pan-Africanist conception of Afrofuturism, even as we, re re we retain the distinctiveness of each subfuturism. She suggests the term planetary Afrofuturism as a way to conceive of these branches in relationship with each other rather than in competition. She says, the notion of planetarity invokes planet Earth in a way that suits discussions of science fiction. It may also serve as a way of conceptualizing the pan-African flows and loops of Afrofuturism, not as forms of US imperial domination, but as a cosmopolitan solidarity from below and afar. And here she is quoting Paul Gilroy again from his book, Postcolonial Melancholia. Samatar underscores that that solidarity inheres in the way that all of these texts look back to the past as they face forward to the future for people of African heritage. And here she's invoking the principle of Sankofa, um, which in the Ghanaian language literally translates, go back and get it. As this stamp form illustrates, the Sankofa bird does not simply go back, but it plants a seed for the future with what is gained from the past in the present. Planetary Afrofuturism is rooted in that Sankofa mandate. Here we've seen that futuristic writing from various African diasporic places draws on past and presents that are distinctive from those of the continent of Africa. And there's no question about it. But I hope that this lecture has also shown that the common preoccupation that those texts raise in the present for the future make it valuable to read them together. <laughs>